Did you know that darkness can affect our mood? In Michigan, we feel it when the seasons change. But is it just a case of the winter blues or something more serious? Let's talk about it. Welcome to My Healthy Mind. I'm Michael Hunter, and this is Elizabeth Atkins. Each week on My Healthy Mind, we talk openly about difficult situations that can impact our mental health and well-being. We discuss a variety of issues that many people struggle with on a daily basis and are sometimes too afraid to talk about. Our guests include people who are willing to tell their personal stories about how they've overcome challenging problems that include mental health issues, abuse, and addiction. By sharing their personal struggles, our guests give us the opportunity to talk openly about these subjects and answer questions that you, our viewers, may have. We also invite experts and experienced professionals to talk about valuable resources for individuals and families in need of help and to begin a journey towards better health. Elizabeth, let's tell our viewers what we're going to talk about today. Michael, today we're going to talk about a type of depression called seasonal affective disorder. We'll find out how common it may be, especially for people who live in states like Michigan where seasons can change dramatically. Joining us today from Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit are Dr. Gregory Maher, a psychiatrist, and Dr. Stephen Katayan, an exercise physiologist. Both are experienced in treating people who have seasonal affective disorder. And later in our program, we'll meet Carla Genzinger, who was diagnosed with seasonal affective disorder. Carla will share her personal experience with a very real problem that may be unfamiliar to our viewers. Please join us after the break. I was feeling so alone. I was going through a really difficult time. I didn't want to bother anyone. I didn't think they'd understand. It was tough at first, but I did it. I'm glad I asked for help. I asked my teacher. I asked my dad. You can do this. Whatever it is, ask for help. If you're thinking about suicide or need support, call the Trevor Lifeline. Trained counselors are there to help 24-7. Stress, depression, and severe mental illness can happen to anyone. Team Mental Health Services has been helping those struggling with these conditions in southeastern Michigan. Within 24 hours of reaching out to our team, members receive psychiatric evaluations and begin the necessary treatment for recovery. Team Mental Health Services prides itself on going the extra mile for its members. And it was towards the sixth court date. Um, I finally stood up and said, I, I can handle this process the rest of the way. And it was all because of the motivation and encouragement I got from Team Mental Health staff. Team Mental Health Services, because we care and you can. Welcome back to My Healthy Mind. Today we're talking with Dr. Gregory Marr, a psychiatrist with Henry Ford Hospital. His patients include individuals with seasonal affective disorder, or SAD. Dr. Marr, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Can you tell us what seasonal affective disorder is and what the symptoms are? It's a form of depression, so it has the usual symptoms of depression, like changes in sleep and appetite, loss of pleasure in, in usual activities, persistent sadness. Um, seasonal affective disorder is a little different form of depression because it consistently occurs in the darker times of year, so there's that persistent pattern. And it tends to look a little different than regular depression. People have slightly different symptoms. They tend to almost what, like you would imagine, they're hibernating, like they're, they're okay if they're not bothered too much, but if you kind of 
wake them up and want them to do something. They're kind of irritable and cranky. They tend to eat more and sleep more. And they sometimes have something called light hunger, where they, they, they really want to turn the lights on all the time and want to be in bright light. They're kind of drawn to that almost. Light hunger, that's a fascinating term. Yeah, it was actually first described by um, Norman Rosenthal, who kind of created the diagnosis, who was a psychiatrist at National Institute of Mental Health. And actually one of his patients sort of created the diagnosis because he was uh, kept very detailed accounts of, of his moods and when he was depressed and things like that, and detailed logs over many years. And, and he described a story where he was uh, feeling very depressed and it was very dark, and he went into this church that was full of bright lights, and he, it was like a mystical experience because he suddenly felt better with all the bright lights mm -hmm. and things like that. That's a good example of that kind of light hunger. We all feel that way because in the winter, it's dark when we go to work and it's dark when we get home. So how many people actually have seasonal affective disorder? Uh, the full-blown disorder affects about 5% of the population. It's more common in women, probably twice as common in women. And it's more in these kind of regions where there's more cloudy. The, the milder forms of the disorder, like winter blues, probably affects 20% of the population. How important is it to get help for the d disorder? Well, the, the nice thing is treatment is very effective, either therapy or, or some of the antidepressant medications can be helpful, or what's kind of specific for the seasonal depression are, are the lights. If you expose people to bright lights for about half an hour, especially in the morning, that seems to work pretty well, and about 60 or 70 percent of people will, who have seasonal depression will respond to the lights alone or a combination of lights and therapy. Dr. Marr, you brought this light therapy box with you. Can you tell us how it works? Yeah, I wanted to show you how, how bright it is. So it, it's a, wow. it takes a while to warm up, but it's actually fairly bright. And um, so you want to put this somewhere. Now it's all the way on. You want to put it somewhere where it can be close to you for a, about half an hour in the morning, like beside your desk when you're working. Uh, maybe to do some paperwork for half an hour in the morning. It's best in the morning. Uh, because sometimes people feel more energy when the light's on, so it's probably less than ideal to have it at bedtime or in the evening. And as bright as it is, is it a light that I can pick up at Home Depot or something like that? Um, it, it, it's, it's visible light. It doesn't have to be UV or anything like that. It's actually it's better without the UV. Um, there's nothing fancy about it, but your typical light at a, at a uh, hardware store won't be quite this bright. Um, so you're probably better off l looking online, like under seasonal affective disorder light therapy, and, and there's many different versions of these light kind of lights. Some are smaller and much handier. This happens to be an older, large one. There's some new fancy ones that you can wear like a um, band around the around your forehead. So when you prescribe this to your patients who have seasonal affective disorder, what else do you tell them to do regarding their behaviors that could? alleviate their symptoms? Um, the other things that help are being outside because the, the, even on a cloudy day, the visible light outside, although it doesn't seem that way, is actually much brighter than indoor light. So do as much as you can outside. Exercise is really helpful. Um, ideally, exercise outside if you can. Um, and th those kinds of things are, are very helpful. And it, maybe that's why some winter cities have like winter festivals, kind of that helps get people outside and things like that. So those, those things are all very important. Dr. Marr, thank you so much for helping our viewers get a better understanding of seasonal affective disorder. You're welcome. When we return after a short break, Dr. Stephen Katayan, an exercise physiologist and colleague of Dr. Marr's at Henry Ford Hospital, will join us to talk more about how exercise helps people with seasonal affective disorder and other forms of depression. We'll be right back. I was feeling so alone. I was going through a really difficult time. 
I didn't want to bother anyone. I didn't think they'd understand. It was tough at first, but I did it. I'm glad I asked for help. I asked my teacher. I asked my dad. You can do this. Whatever it is, ask for help. If you're thinking about suicide or need support, call the Trevor Lifeline. Trained counselors are there to help 24-7. It began with my big toe. That was my first amputation that I had. Burger's disease, it's a vascular disease brought on by smoking. My fingers started to go piece by piece. First it was my left leg. After my left leg, it was my right leg. And so now I'm a double amputee, all from smoking. My tip to everyone is, don't believe that this can happen to you, because it can. You can quit. For free help, call 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Welcome back to My Healthy Mind. Today we're talking about seasonal affective disorder. Dr. Stephen Catan, an exercise physiologist, is with us to explain the role that exercise plays in the treatment of this form of depression. Dr. Catan, welcome. Can you start by telling us what an exercise physiologist is? Sure, maybe best to give you an example. So you cut your lawn, you walk a flight of stairs, you go for a walk. The body adjusts to all those. Your heart adjusts, your lung adjusts, your muscles adjust, your brain adjusts. Uh, exercise physiologists study not only how your body adjusts to all of that, both people with a health problem and normal people, but we also follow over time somebody who repeats that. They go for regular walks, they go for regular bike rides, they involved in a habitual activity. How does the body respond to that for both people who have a health problem in those that are, let's say, free of disease. And then we could use exercise as a form of therapy as we learn more about how they adjust. So when someone is referred to you who has depression, how do you prescribe exercise as therapy for them? Well, the, the really good news is um, the same recommendations we would use for public health, for uh, people with free of disease, the recommendations for exercise for people with seasonal affective disorder are exactly the same and that is 150 minutes of moderate-based exercise each week or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise. Vigorous for us might be we go cross-country skiing or we're gonna go for a slow jog, whereas moderate-based exercise is you and I go for a brisk walk or something like that together. And that recommendation is very effective for both people who suffer from depression in terms of helping decrease the, the amount or the magnitude or, uh, of what they suffer as well as people who have cardiovascular disease or suffering from cancer or healthy people. And when they exercise, especially if it's seasonal affective disorder, do you encourage them to exercise as much as possible outside? Well, clearly. Um, in fact, studies have been done uh, at low light and high light as well as just outside. And clearly, um, outside and high light seem to be, uh, higher light seem to be more effective. So outside exercise is very helpful. And it's not so much, um, you know, ultraviolet as it is just exposure to brighter light. So the more they can expose themselves to that, the, the better. So Dr. Katayan, can you explain why exercise is such a great therapy for depression and seasonal affective disorder? Well, there's a $50,000 question. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the, the actual mechanism by which it works for depression probably isn't really perfectly understood. But I think we've all felt before the mood elevation or the stress relief or maybe the calm after a bout of exercise that seems to carry over. And if you repeat that bout, that seems to have a longer lasting effect. There are chemicals in the brain that are called neurotransmitters that when one cell wants to talk to another, so to speak, these chemicals are involved. So what effect exercise has on those chemicals may play, one would hypothesize that they play a role. And as you look at it, so you look at a patient and you say, okay, tell me what you did. And from your profession, you're analyzing the, the changes or the trends, right? Right, I mean, you'd wanna make sure that, and, and when, you, when you speak about exercise, in some ways, it's just like a medication. You know, what's the dose? How frequently have to I take it? What's the milligrams we want to take? Uh, how, how long do I want to take it? Is it a couple weeks? Is it a three-day course? You think of that with respect to exercise. You know, three times per week or five times per week for 30 minutes versus 60 minutes, higher intensity versus lower intensity. All those things can be modified to what we, what we refer to as affecting the overall dose or the volume that they're exposed to. And, and for people with uh, depression, uh, including seasonal affective depression, you don't need a really high dose. Again, three times per week, four or five times per week seems to have a pretty good effect on helping these people. And do you have any statistics to measure the success of exercise in helping depression? Yeah, you've, you, um, I'll put it two ways. If you, 
if you treat depression uh, with, let's say, a medication, uh, which we know are very, very effective, or with cognitive behavioral therapy or behavioral therapy, exercise seems to be a, as effective in those people as you would see in the treatment with medication or cognitive therapy. I'll also say that you, you, you won't get um, all patients who are exposed to exercise who have depression with less depression, but it seems to be somewhere between a 30 to a 50 percent response rate. So in terms of free, easy access, relatively easy to do, a walking program is a good first step in terms of treating it. And doctor, you mentioned CBT, and we understand that form of therapy. So when patients are encouraged to go to the gym, often that commercial gym is dark or not well lit. Do we make it a conscious decision to tell them to exercise outside as well? No, I, I, first off, all of the above in terms of health benefit with exercise. Let's first just do it, right? I know it's like a commercial, but we should first just make sure we do it, and that's what we want to do. So higher light or lower light, obviously I think higher light would be better. Um, and, but, and so we're clear, um, it could be in, right now in terms of de de depression management, most of the focus of exercise tends to be more in the aerobic type activities, walking, biking, um, swimming, and, and cross country skiing if it's going to be a, ice skating if it's a winter month. So I think those would all be effective, but, but one could argue, and it just hasn't been as well studied, studied, resistance training and band work and floor work and body work, circuit work. I think one might make the argument that those would probably be equal or beneficial, but most of the data so far has been more in the aerobic type activities. Dr. Katayan, thank you so much for helping our viewers to get a better understanding of seasonal affective disorder and how exercise therapy can help. Truly my pleasure. When we return after a short break, we'll talk with Carla Ginzinger, who was diagnosed and treated for seasonal affective disorder. We'll be right back. I was feeling so alone. I was going through a really difficult time. I didn't want to bother anyone. I didn't think they'd understand. It was tough at first, but I did it. I'm glad I asked for help. I asked my teacher. I asked my dad. You can do this. Whatever it is, ask for help. If you're thinking about suicide or need support, call the Trevor Lifeline. Trained counselors are there to help 24-7. It began with my big toe. That was my first amputation that I had. Burger's disease, it's a vascular disease brought on by smoking. My fingers started to go piece by piece. First it was my left leg. After my left leg, it was my right leg. And so now I'm a double amputee, all from smoking. My tip to everyone is, don't believe that this can happen to you, because it can. You can quit. For free help, call 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Stress, depression, and severe mental illness can happen to anyone. Team Mental Health Services has been helping those struggling with these conditions in southeastern Michigan. Within 24 hours of reaching out to our team, members receive psychiatric evaluations and begin the necessary treatment for recovery. Team Mental Health Services prides itself on going the extra mile for its members. And it was towards the sixth court date. Um, I finally stood up and said, I, I can handle this process the rest of the way. And it was all because of the motivation and encouragement I got from Team Mental Health staff. Team Mental Health Services, because we care and you can. Welcome back to My Healthy Mind. Today we've already received some valuable information from doctors about the diagnosis and treatment of seasonal affective disorder. Now we're going to meet and talk with Carla Ginzinger, a graphic designer who's willing to share her story about this form of depression. Carla, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. It's very thank courageous. You. You're welcome. You're welcome. So how did you know that you were affected by seasonal affective disorder? Well, probably um, it started in my 20s. Um, I kind of noticed that I would, uh, you know, certain time of the year I would get kind of down and feel like I was sort of closing in mm -hmm. on myself. Um, and then at some point I, uh, I started to have anxiety as well. And that's what became really hard um, to deal with. Um, it was just sort of a general anxiety and I really wasn't sure where it was starting. But I, I noticed that uh, every year around April or May it would lift and I would feel normal again. So it, it kind of happened a few years in a row. And that's when I was prescribed some medication. Um, the medication, though, I felt like was a little um, 
either wasn't the right fit for me or whatever because I felt like I was flatlining. So I had to try to figure out other ways to deal with this um, for myself um, without medication. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what that anxiety felt like and what does the flat line feel like? Oh, okay. So the anxiety is just this general where you, it's almost like, you know, it can come in many forms, but you, you feel like you you can't really um, live your life normally. Um, you, you can get uh, hyperventilating uh, in situations um, f almost for no reason. Um, you just have this general anxiousness and um, it becomes very hard to you know, interact, uh, work, drive, you know, and it, and it could be brought on by anything. Um, but I noticed, like I said, it was always in the darker months of the year. Um, when I, I was living in Chicago, when I moved back to Michigan, um, I did notice that, um, like, by February or March, I'd be driving to work, and I would just have tears streaming down my face for, you know, no apparent reason. I. I was, I had a perfectly fine life, there was nothing wrong, but so that's when I really felt like I have to get this under control. I was prescribed um, light therapy f from a doctor, an understanding doctor, and um, it has worked really well for me. Uh, I use it at work in the darker months, I turn it on when I, sometimes when I get to work, and then toward the end of the day for about a half an hour. I also make sure that I get outside as much as possible during these months, like a day like you know, a sunny day is perfect, but even a cloudy day, I try and take like a 10 or 15 minute walk at lunch. Um, and when you first started to seek help, did you know it was seasonal affective disorder or you just need, knew something uh, was not right? You know, I don't think I knew right away what it was. Um, it, but like, I think after a, a couple seasons of it and realizing it always happened, you know, at the same time every year and then would lift uh, as May or April came around, um, then I, I kind of, I, maybe somebody suggested it to me, and then it came up, became apparent that that's what it was. Because as soon as the um, spring arrived, my mood would lift again, you know, and I would feel normal. Had you heard of seasonal affective disorder prior to your diagnosis? I don't, I don't know. I, I maybe I did, um, or maybe a, you know, maybe the doctor, you know, explained it to me. I, you know, I can't remember at this point, but. Um, it was really obvious once I realized what it was that this is what I had. Do you ever worry that people might say, oh, you're just complaining, there's nothing wrong with you? Um, so, you know, there are times or, you know, that people might not understand, people who don't um, suffer from it. But I feel like, um, especially living in Michigan, a lot of people do get it. And they're, you know, as soon as I talk about it or they mention it, they're like, oh, I get it. I get like that too, you know, I felt like that, um, especially, you know, toward the end of winter. Um, I think sometimes in the beginning of the season, um, maybe people can still feel up, but I think it just, maybe it wears on them physically at that point. So I think, you know, toward the end of winter is where it really kicks in. If you can get um, somewhere sunny and warm for a midwinter break, I think that helps. Um, but I do think uh, exercise, and eating right, avoiding alcohol, those have all worked really well for me. Um, and it's, it's really got it under control. I do not have the anxiety. Um, and, and the depression is more winter blues versus you know something that's really debilitating and hard to get through. And it's interesting you said no alcohol. And that's because alcohol is a depressant or can be. Right, and I think, you know, like I, I avoid, I guess, is not, you know, it's not a, it's like a hard n no alcohol, but I think if you do have it, um, it's probably better to avoid it because you could be adding to the depressant. Carla, thank you so much for joining us today and telling your story, You're helping so many people. Well, I hope so, it's my pleasure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. When we come back, we'll ask our viewers to send us other topics they want us to talk about on My Healthy Mind. Everything's fine. 
It began with my big toe. That was my first amputation that I had. Burger's disease, it's a vascular disease brought on by smoking. My fingers started to go piece by piece. First it was my left leg. After my left leg, it was my right leg. And so now I'm a double amputee, all from smoking. My tip to everyone is, don't believe that this can happen to you, because it can. You can quit. For free help, call 1-800-QUIT-NOW. I was feeling so alone. I was going through a really difficult time. I didn't want to bother anyone. I didn't think they'd understand. It was tough at first, but I did it. I'm glad I asked for help. I asked my teacher. I asked my dad. You can do this. Whatever it is, ask for help. If you're thinking about suicide or need support, call the Trevor Lifeline. Trained counselors are there to help 24-7. We are this close. We're this close. We are this close. Of our mentality. To making history. This close to changing the world. We are this close. This close. To making sure no child suffers a crippling disease. Ever again. This close. We are this close to ending polio. To ending polio. Help Rotary make history at endpolionow.org. Welcome back to My Healthy Mind. Michael, I really want to thank Dr. Katay and Dr. Ma and Carla for coming on to educate us about seasonal affective disorder. I really learned a lot today. I did too. I really didn't know it was a real problem right. until hearing Carla's story and the doctors explain it. Mm -hmm. So it really moved me in that sense. I remember one time having an employee who said they were suffering from such, and we responded accordingly, but I really had no appreciation for it until today. Mm -hmm. Well, I have always had an appreciation for it because I know that my mood suffers when it gets cold and, and dreary outside, and the first sign of sunlight, I'm out there. I mean, I'll be bundled up, but I just got to get that sunlight, and you immediately feel better. So yeah, I can just... and it's such a simple therapy in, in a sense because it's, you know, get the light and expose yourself to the light as much as possible. And the effects of it apparently are amazing yes. and apparently real. Yes. So that was really, really interesting. Real to the point that people who have it on a more dramatic level actually get medication for it. So it is real. I, I love that that's showing the mission of My Healthy Mind. Someone might be afraid to talk about these symptoms that they're having because people could not take them seriously or think they're just complaining. Yeah, and the other doctor said that, you know, you can exercise and how important it is to exercise outside. That was news to me. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciated that. I learned a lot from today's show. Before we close today, we want to remind our My Healthy Mind viewers that there are no topics about mental health and wellness issues that are off limits on our show. In fact, we encourage you, our viewers, to let us know what you want to hear us discuss. Please visit our website at MyHealthyMind.com. You'll find some helpful resources along with a convenient way to contact us. We keep your information private. Thank you again for joining us today.